even I can claim that for your safety, I want to arrest you. But mm. once you are with me, I will put you in a prison. And one night is enough. Mm. I'll get a, along with you, smash your head. And he must be a crazy person and we'll take care of him. Or anyway, when you come to me, I'll break your both legs and hands because you tried to escape from the police. I said, what are you speaking? In Mumbai, in 2012, there was a claim in a Mumbai church mm -hmm. that the statue of Jesus there is weeping. Ah, yes. I mean, it, like like Mary weeping. I mean, that's known everywhere. I mean, that such claims are there, and it was it was exposed and explained everywhere. But this was a very special case. Mm -hmm. This was a statue standing on a wall in front of the church, mm -hmm. and water was dripping. But not one or two drips. It was dripping down and people were collecting the droplets in mm. bottles from the feet. Uh -huh. And a lot of water. It was just keeping on coming. Which church and was it again? That was uh, Ville Parle Catholic Church in the Mumbai Ville Parle. Ah, okay. I, I lived in Delhi at that time. And most of these kind of claims would come on television and I would be asked to comment on that. And I was naturally, I was asked. To comment on that, I was sitting in the Delhi studio and the miracle was shown. It looked like something very fishy and strange. That was my first impression seeing the clippings. Water was dripping and dripping down <laughs> continuously. People were collecting. And then the local people have been claiming very interesting that uh, somebody who had cancer was suddenly cured. And uh, somebody had a, a, a blurry in his vision. He could uh, see now. Ailments are getting cured. And also there was a mentioning in the TV report that they have app applied for a miracle status in Vatican. In, in a Catholic church, to get it established as a pilgrimage place, they have to formally get approval from Vatican and they have applied for it. And I looked at the background and I found that similar claims were made in some other churches also in Mumbai. They mm -hmm. applied for miracle status, but somehow it was not sanctioned at that time because there were some public criticism or opposition or meantime it stopped, whatever it is. I said, come on, this is a simple thing. A statue cannot cry. It's common sense. If you yeah. believe, yes, you can believe anything. But it's just common sense. It's no scientific explanation to go it that mm. the statue was not crying. It could be some water trap somewhere. Maybe it has a crack on his head. Some brain water has fallen in. Maybe they have manipulated something. I cannot say it's sitting in Delhi. It is, but the church authorities, if they have an open mind, instead of calling it a miracle, they should just apply their critical mindset, go and look around and try to see what it was. Was this clear that was, that was coming out of the eyes, his tears? Yeah, but the focusing was given on the feet. Water was dripping from oh. the feet. Okay. That was, that, that was how it was. So the, one could not see the eyes because it's a tall statue something like five, six feet tall statue. I and see. around straight to our side, one can see feet and feet. The water was dripping. There is no other source one can see. And it was a kind of a heated argument. I They took it very serious. And they said that, come on, this is a real miracle. And we all are experiencing it. The first person who experienced it was not even a Christian, but a Hindu. I said, that doesn't make any difference. Because people who want to believe, they would believe no matter where it is and who it is. So why don't you just, just try to study it instead of just blindly taking it as a miracle? So they said, come on, this is a miracle. And if you want, you are telling about evidences for everything and you are sitting in Delhi and saying that it's not a miracle, mm -hmm. why don't you come and study the whole thing? And if it's not a miracle, explain it. That's an open, friendly challenge. I said, if you permit, I can come there. And I can verify it. And if your people won't attack me for studying it, then I can come over there. Uh -huh. I don't have I don't have any prejudice, but you can also probably find it. Okay. And it ended there because I clearly said that look, there for a statue, there is there, there are no tear glands. And humans excrete a lot of water by sweating, by I mean crying, by saliva, urination, a lot of things. But a statue would not do that. It's very simple. Ask a little child and he would understand it. When you're blind with your belief, only you think that it's a miracle. Okay, they 
invited me after, I mean, that, that was on the 3rd of March. I remember these dates because I mean, this was very important in my life. And uh, seven days later, they suggested that I could go to Mumbai and again, again personally very fate. And a date was fixed for 10th of March, 2012. I, yes, I decided to go over there and I took a friend along with me who is a civil engineer. I thought if I could not understand what was happening, there is, this is a cement statue and one may be able to understand it better. I should get a little expert support, I thought. Together we have gone. And once I reached there, it was very interesting. I'm narrating the story because it's very interesting in a way how it all happened. When I reached there, the first thing that I noticed was some 200 to 300 people were standing in front of the statue and a prayer was going on. The priest was reading from Bible mm -hmm. about miracles of Jesus. And then people were kneeling and then they're standing up. And then after the prayer, then I waited outside this scene. And after the prayer, the somebody distributes this water. to People take it in their palm. Many people immediately lick it and some droplets are given to everybody. People lick it and drink it. And it was brought to me also without noticing who I was. I did not take it in my hand, mm -hmm. but I collected it in a small vessel, which I had. Uh, my friend immediately sent it for chemical examination. That was the first way of handling this thing. So after that, I didn't go alone. I went with the television crew. Wonderful. The television, uh, yeah. I talked to TV9, one of the major channels, which has uh, first spoke, one of the biggest channels in Mumbai. The crew was with me. And they have been recording the whole thing. And then priest comes to me. And after the prayer, I said, I am Sanal. I came because of your invitation and you have given this time. Yes. The priest comes to me and say that the king gives me immediately a small hammer. I don't take it. But I said, why, why do you give me this hammer? You said there could be water trapped inside. I said, that was one of the possibilities that I suggested. Oh, okay, his position was, if it was... Uh, water trapped in it. You can smash the statue and see if there was any water in it. I immediately understood what was the intention. Yeah. I mean, imagine a moment I take this hammer in my hands, a hundred photographs will be taken. And if I smash it somewhere or crack or even touch it, it will be seen immediately as a crazy person smashing their statue. And that's, they were making several possibilities trap me down. Then somebody said, you want to dig down the bottom? You can even dig down. Then what happens? It will fall down. Yes. So some, somebody brings a picas. I said, no, I don't want anything. Mm -hmm. So I, instead, without touching anywhere, I just looked the whole thing. And one of the first things that I noticed, probably, as you asked rightly, mm -hmm. the water perhaps was not coming from the ice because mm -hmm. it looked dry. That's a primary observation. I didn't touch on anything. Okay. When I just, this is touching a wall, half wall on the outskirts of the church, I go inside. And there I found three, quickly one small thing. Just behind the statue on the wall, there is fresh algae, fresh green algae growing. And that looked fresh. But it was going towards one side, one direction. And, and where it ends, I went up to a corner of the wall and it ends there. Common sense to understand that apparently some water source was there and water is coming there. It's not from one or two days. Occasionally rains were there and this water presence has given a possibility to grow this, this green colored fungus growing there. So I went to the possible source place, the corner, and then I found that there was a drainage line, an open drainage line covered with the stones. And I, I didn't have even a gloves or anything, but out of curiosity, I just opened it. It was stinking smell all around. It was a drainage line coming from the toilet. Oh. And, <laughs> and this was a point where this would go to the city line. And uh -huh. this was the connecting point where it will be draining down to the city line. But there was a blockage and it has no way to go. Naturally, when water is blocked and it has no way to go, it will go through small pores Anywhere, capillary action, simple thing. And it went through the cemented wall, or it could possibly reach, it has tried to reach, but it found one outlet. That was the statue outside. On the statue, there was a, a nail on the feet. Jesus, the statue, there are five holy wounds. Yeah. The nails were on, on the feet and the hands, and, and this nail 
above the feet. There was a hole, and the water climbed through this. And since there was a hole, only I thought water could be draining down from there. That was my primary observation. But mm. how would I confirm it? I cleaned my hand and went outside, and then I touched above the nail line. My assumption was correct. It was completely dry. From the nail down, water was dripping. It was not coming from the eyes, but from the nail on the feet. And it was actually the clogged toilet drainage water. And that was what they have been serving to people as holy water. Later, I know that okay. the, there was diarrhea in the whole area. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Oh, that's disgusting. This was it. it very simple and little humorous at that time. Mm. But I understood the potential danger at that moment because I could not say it publicly. There was a crowd, a devout crowd waiting outside. Very curious because everybody knew my criticism. People knew that I was coming. And there could be normal people, but there could be some angry, fanatic people also amongst them. So my expectation was correct. When I came out, they said, what did you find? I said, I did not find anything. I have to, I've made some observations. I have to, I've taken a lot of photographs. I've taken small videos and I have to see the whole thing because already I knew what was happening. I only wanted to get a confirmation from the chemical analysis of the water. Also, mm -hmm. That was a reconfirmation about my observation. So they said I should explain it there and then. Otherwise, I would not be allowed to go. I smelt danger. And then I looked around and all the people were sitting on chairs there. But I immediately located three, four people holding plastic chairs in their hands. Means they were the people to attack me the moment I say something. So I said, I don't have to say anything. I will just go now. No, you are not allowed to go. They stopped me. It was a plan to invite me, to get me into a trap there. That was the plan. That is why the hammer was brought, and that was the pickaxe was brought, and then everything was pre planned. So I said, okay, I should explain to the crowd what I have seen. I should not speak something else later on television. Mm. Okay. I thought I should use this opportunity. I thought of Mark Antony, how one could twist a speech at one point. And I started speaking to these people. It was a little tricky. I first explained that according to your belief, miracles happen. But all claims are not accepted by Vatican. It wants a kind of a verification and there should be devil's advocate. And only after that, they would approve a miracle, which means all claims are not miracles, even according to your faith. And also, many times, the claims that are coming from different sources without understanding what it is could mm. not be miracle. Then I went and explained the one miracle in northern India, in Himachal Pradesh, where mm. fire was coming from water for a long time. Long time during the Mughal Empire's time and all, it was seen as a devil by some people. Some people found it as a holy thing. Now we know that this is an inflammable natural glass mm. getting released. But still, that is worshipped as a goddess. Zwala Mukhi. It's a goddess and people are, it's a pilgrimage there. Yeah. I ask people, do you know about this story? But it's not a miracle, we all know. But for mm. many people, it's a miracle. So then another example, I took examples from other cultures and other religions. I took the example of another thing in Mumbai some years back. There was seawater turning sweet. Again, I have been there studying the whole thing and found that it was a city drainage going into the water and water currents brought it and that was near a mosque and they thought it's a miracle of Allah. But it was not. Now everyone knows that it was not. So people, now I found the elder ladies and all, they are shaking their head that I'm in approval. And then I also, I spoke about the Indian constitution where we have to have a critical spirit of inquiry and spirit of reform and that's the duty of everybody. I mm. started speaking and the priest was getting annoyed and unhappy and he said enough you can go now because he didn't want me to continue with this speech but that was a moment I just almost ran to the car <laughs> sat there and uh, escaped from there but that was not planned by them they wanted me to be trapped there and once I moved from there I understood that there could be a danger but the television channels were very happy because they got enough fine clippings they said we are going to have a big show in the evening we would invite the representatives of the church also and you could explain what you found. I said, wonderful. Prime time in Mumbai. And that was perhaps seen by a lot of people. And I was given 10 minutes to explain what I found. I explained the whole thing with pictures and it's small images and everything that I had. And then a debate for 30 minutes with four representatives or five representatives from the church at one side 
and I alone on the other side. And the church, the priest has come and their lawyer, very interestingly, a Supreme Court lawyer oh. on behalf of the church joins. It's a very interesting event. And uh, But the moment we all sat in one room and at the moment I said, as I explained, this was not a miracle, but this was drainage water. It's not your mistake, I said. But that moment, one of these people tried to jump on me to attack me physically. It was difficult to continue this program. So then I was taken to another room. The debate continues. It shows that we all were sitting in different windows, but I alone was sitting in this lawn room <laughs> so that they won't attack me. I didn't experience such a thing in the televisions ever before. Then the bishop calls to the mm -hmm. channel and I said, miracles do not happen. If you don't understand, you say it's a miracle. Yeah. I would say rather, I don't understand. Then I try to study it. If I understand, I will explain it. Otherwise, say that this is a phenomenon we are yet to understand. That's how we should see it. That's what's my position. So the bishop wanted to stop the program and he called the television channel and asked them to stop it. The channel was courageous enough and they said, no, we cannot stop the program, but you could join the program and counter what he said. The bishop agreed and the auxiliary bishop of Mumbai joins the program. So it becomes a very different level of discussion. And so he took it. Of course, till he came, all these people claimed that it was a miracle. I said, water was climbing up the wall. No, water won't climb up. It will go down only. That's the law of gravity. Gravitation is a law of God and water goes down only. It never goes up. Okay. I said, ask your, if somebody has a child who studies in the fourth standard, mm. there is a lesson on, on capillary action, how plants are getting water. I mean, all these kind of things I try to explain. So anyway, the bishop joined the program and he took a very different position. He said, this could be explained by physics. I said, fair enough, but miracles would happen. I said, oh, there is a serious dispute on that point. I would not say that miracles would happen. There are many things that you don't understand. He said immediately. So there should be a scientific attitude, scientific approach to the whole thing. The bishop immediately twisted the whole thing. He said, in fact, what is your right to speak about science? We should speak about science as Catholic Church because we are responsible for the scientific growth in Europe. And science has developed because of our patronage. Uh -huh. well, that was a statement. Right. But the, he asked me, are you laughing? I said, look, I asked him whether he believed in exorcism. He said he would not believe in such things. I said, unfortunately, a Pope believes. The Pope had a meeting of exorcist priests in Poland some months back. He said, that's a lie. I said, come on. There was a report in New York Times. And I was myself in Poland immediately after that. And I know about it. And I know the first hand information in front of me. Your church believes in exorcism. There are experts for exorcism. Okay, he said, for an argument, I would accept that. Then I said, what is happening in exorcism? You're invoking the spirit of the dead people, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the belief of exorcism. Then I said, here's the point I want. If your church believes in exorcism, I would like your help to get two witnesses to counter your argument about how you supported science. He said, what exactly you are telling? Come to the point. I said very clearly, the two Spirits you have to, I don't believe in spirit, but since you believe in spirit and you can invoke spirits, two spirits I want you to invoke are of Galileo Galilei and Leonardo Bruno. Let them vouch for me here, whether you promoted science or persecuted scientists. That was <laughs> a little long way to reach there, but <laughs> the cameraman understood the joke and other people in this studio understood. They all started laughing. Yeah. But the bishop did not get it initially. But after a minute, he understood. Then he was so furious and he walked off the program so angrily. And he said, you're insulting the Christian faith. And that turned everything. And I could not come out of the studio after that. When the program was over, the head of the channel invades me for a dinner. I yeah. said, come on, I have a plan for eating outside. No, you cannot go outside. There are people with staff and sticks waiting outside for you. I said, oh, what? This studio is not in the main city also, it's far away. They are supposed to be angry Catholics attacking you. And they want to kill you outside. They're waiting there. It looks strange. Nobody knows even where the channel's actual studio would be. And it's not in the main city. And then some of the cameramen came and said that, look, I know the people outside. I looked, peeped over the wall. And I found that some of them are known goons in the city. They're beating boys. You pay money and they go and beat people. They're the kind of people. And they were brought in vans by the church. 
So they are waiting for you, pretending to be Catholics, going to attack me. And we waited two, three hours inside. They were not leaving. They were just waiting. There was only one gate. So later, they opened backside, a small, what you call a, a gate, which is meant for garbage taking and all. And I came out and the taxi was waiting for me. And I went to my hotel and I changed my flight time and left for Delhi one or two hours earlier. I came to know that my flight was known and there were people waiting for me at the airport also. But before that, I could leave. That was taken that serious. And the next day, there were reports that there were cases filed against me in so many police stations for blasphemy. Not right. one. 27 complaints in different police stations, in different Wait, parts of seven. Maharashtra. Means if I could come out from one arrest, another case is waiting for me. And this law is a very interesting law, Article 295A in the Indian Penal yes. Code, came from during the British time, which says that a person with uh, malicious intention, if he had the senti religious sentiments of somebody, he can be arrested, it is cognizable and non-bailable. Okay. This law is still there, and it does not need judicial interference to arrest a person. You don't have to make a report and get the sanction of the courts to arrest a person. But the police officer, if he is pleased, he can arrest the person and keep him in his custody up to six months and can get extension also. And it's a very hard law. This was used once against Periyar E.B. Ramaswamy in 1960s. And the case was registered and he came out of it. That's another story. But anyway, I decided to fight this case. So it's a great opportunity because this law should go. One of the possibilities is that if you have any law, the British law of the criminal laws in India, that's very old. In 1857, they made these laws and it, made, it got some amendments and all. But when the Indian constitution came in 1950, India did not make a new criminal law. The Indian penal code that existed was adapted by the new government. At that time, it's an established system. And one agreement was that if any law becomes violative of the fundamental rights, that law becomes null and void. So that with that guarantee, this was taken as India's criminal law. Back in 1960s, somebody has made public interest litigation against this case, but that was not a well-prepared case, and that was dismissed by the Supreme Court. So there is no possibility to go for another public interest litigation. But if I am a victim of this law, then I can challenge it, and probably I will win and stop this law. That was my point. So we made a defense committee and set of lawyers got prepared. And we made an international campaign and collected all material of how this law is getting misused. But... That was not ending there. I had physical threats. I was advised by the police to be careful because I could be attacked. I could be intimidated. And the, some people in the home ministry was helping me. They got intelligence information that since I was in Delhi, the Mumbai police come and arrest me at Delhi without a metropolitan magistrate's permission. Therefore, the bishop wants me to be abducted from Delhi to Mumbai. So they paid the underground mafia for that. So therefore, I should be careful. That's what I was asked. So I moved from my home, stayed in some friend's house, but still I appeared on television, spoke about this case and made it public. And uh, all the media started reporting the whole thing. And I said, I'm going to face this case if I'm not killed. And so the Indian media started taking it very seriously. CNN, and IBM reported and French media, Times of India, Hindustan Times, anyway, everybody mm -hmm. reported. And then slowly it caught up in the international media, Wall Street Journal, CNN, and the New York Times and everywhere it's the BBC, everywhere it started appearing. So then I got another information, again from the government sources only, that one of the, then I was considering the possibility of going to Mumbai to a court and get arrested. Then I'm straightly with the court, not with the police. So this was being planned. And then I get a telephone call, strangely, at midnight. I'm not at home. I'm staying in a secret place to, for my safety. And I get a telephone call on my mobile phone at 12 o'clock at the night. And the person introduces himself as the station house officer, SHO of the Ville Parle police station. I said, why don't you call from a landline during the day? I asked, not from a mobile phone at midnight. He said, I am the police officer. I want to talk to you right now. I said, okay, come on. What do you want? I have a solution for you. I know that you are running for your life. And that will not end up very peacefully because finally you will come to my hands. We have charged the case already. I said, how do you charge the case without taking my statement? I have absolute right by the law. 
even I can claim that for your safety, I want to arrest you. But mm. once you are with me, I will put you in a prison. And one night is enough. Mm. I'll get a, along with you, smash your head. And he must be a crazy person and we'll take care of him. Or anyway, when you come to me, I'll break your both legs and hands because you try to escape from the police. I said, what are you speaking? See, we are in a civilized country and, and oh. you're speaking to a person who is active in the media, publicly known and the leader of a movement. And how do you handle the common people? I said, see, look, very simple. I want all these things. These are all waiting for you. There is a solution. Make an apology to the bishop. Everything will be over. You have a week's time. Mm -hmm. Apologize to the bishop and then the cases are over. So I thought I should make it public. I made it public with the telephone number. And yes, it was true. That was the number of the police officer. And BBC has gone and tried to meet this guy. And no. he said, I want to arrest him. And that's what I said is not something I would not, I would discuss with you. That is going to be BBC radio report also. BBC corresponded all the way to meet this police officer and talk to him. Anyway, so I decided not to go into police. And then meantime, on, on some on the internet, some web groups started discussing how to get me eliminated. Somebody should kill me or if I go to a court, a mob should attack me and I should not reach the court. So I spoke about it publicly. This is what they're discussing. Then it disappears again. So I was very careful at that time, but I decided to speak to media. AFP contacted me and I gave them an interview at my secret hiding place and they published it worldwide. So BBC took it up, CNN took it up and everywhere it was in the world. So then came a situation that my hiding place was not safe. That was even told by police that we know where are you hiding because we are afraid that you'll be attacked there. So then I, I moved to the Jawaharlal Nehru University where I had my research. With the help of a dean, I go to do a hostel room with some students supporting me and I stayed there. So from there, I gave interview to the different journals and it was very active. And then a situation came that it could be very dangerous. Any moment, anything could happen to me. I thought I should go away from India for a couple of months or a couple of weeks so that the dust settles down. And that was my plan. So I had a lecture tour in July in Poland. Uh -huh. I thought that I should go some months early outside India, stay outside, go and have this lecture tour. And meantime, everything will be ready. And then I come back. That was my plan. I tried to talk to friends. Outside India, where to go? Immediately, I wrote to Center for Inquiry, to Paul Cooks. I wrote to a friend in Finland who was the Finnish Humanist Union's president, was my old friend. 25 years, we have been very close friends, and he used to come to Delhi and stayed at my place. And I came to Finland, I stayed at his place. Then I wrote to another friend in London, Robert Eagle, who made a documentary about me for Channel 4. So, first reply came from London. He said, Come over to London. You could stay here. And when things are safe, you can go back. My house is open for you. The third floor where I go, I used to stay there. That's open for you. And he sends an invitation immediately. But the process, my daughter was working in the British High Commission. So I, but it takes five to seven days at least. To, my, my visas were all expired and I have to take fresh visas. So it to take five to seven days to get the British visa. Because it has to go through a different process. It was outsourced. So then came a letter from Center for Inquiry offering me a teaching profession at the Center for Inquiry. Because that can be the official reason to teach there. Because that was being discussed earlier also. That these two options were in my hand. Then came a call from Pekka, who was education secretary here. He said, are you still alive? That was the question. <laughs> I said, yes, I'm still alive. <laughs> then... Uh, because the reports were all coming in Finnish newspapers everywhere in the world at that time. And so then he said, can you travel up to the Finnish embassy? He asked. I said, yes, possible. He said, today is Friday. They will close at 12 o'clock. Now it's 11 o'clock for you in India. Can you reach there before 12 o'clock? I said, yes, possible. Okay. So he said, I am driving to somebody very closely connected to the foreign ministry. And you just go there and file an application for a travel to visa meeting me. I said, how would it work like that? He said, just do it. That's what he said. And uh, I took a friend along with me and I drove to the Finnish embassy and it was 10 minutes to 12 o'clock. As they parked the car in front of the gate, I still remember I mean, the car was towed away late because it was not parked even properly. I rushed inside and uh, told them that I have to file an application for a visa. The lady on the counter said, look, can you do it on Monday? 
because I've taken a, a, a leave because my son's birthday is today and I have to go there. So there are calls coming from Finland for your visa. Is it so? I said, it's so important. You will know it later. So I put in the application and maybe two minutes before 12 o'clock, I give insight. To my surprise, after 30 minutes, I get the visa. And so I was still sitting with the, I think he was sitting with the foreign minister or something like that. And I got the visa. And the next day morning, I flew to Finland. I could not take any clothes from my home or anything because I knew that I could not go to my home because there could be an assassin waiting for me. That was the situation that time. And all my dear people were thinking that I would be killed in some days. That was the general feeling. And I could not go and say goodbye to my children, for example, because that would be a dangerous place. Somebody would be waiting for me nearby. I took two close friends, bought a couple of jeans and some basics and went to the airport late in the night. And it was all very easy there. There was no complication. I, I sent even a ticket. I didn't have to even go for a ticket. He was so friendly, such a great friend. And so everything was ready. Morning, 10 o'clock, I think 10 o'clock, the flight would begin. I was inside night, 9 o'clock. Once sitting in the flight, I sent a text message to James Randi because he was campaigning for me so vehemently, wrote at least a dozen articles in support of me and calling support from everybody. And people like Richard Dawkins and James Randi and all, I should be ever thankful in my life because they have been really supporting me. And Richard Dawkins even initiated, became the first signet of a campaign started by the British Rationalist Association, the publishers of New Humanist, in support of me. And Richard was the first person who signed it. And it was a huge campaign. It got thousands and thousands of people signing every day. It was swelling like anything. But mm -hmm. I texted to James Randi, I'm safe for this moment and I'm going to Finland. I'm in the flight. In mm -hmm. a few seconds, I'll be stopping the phone. So keep, I could not write that he should keep this information safe or should not say it publicly. But mm -hmm. he was overwhelmed and by happiness. I closed the phone. When I reached Finland, six hours later, mm -hmm. the whole media was waiting for me there. You know what happened? Which James Randi, out of his uh, happiness, he sent out immediate article, Sanal is safe. Because there were reports that Sanal is running for his life. Uh -huh. In Canada, there was a report that Sanal is running for his life and what happens to him is not known. So he's a Canadian and living in the United States. And he was worried about that. He said, suddenly he's safe and he's going to Finland. He has sent me a text from the aeroplane. And that was taken by a lot of people and sent out by other people. And it was all around in the Twitter. And the next day I was interviewed by the Finnish television. And I was taken very seriously. And meetings were there to explain the whole thing here. And I came with a return ticket. And the return ticket was extended two times. And I went to Poland and gave my lectures and came back to Finland again. And I planned to go two times. And the second time when I was planning to go, after discussion with one of my closest friends, who is no more, Narendra Dabolkar in Mumbai. Yes, of course we know him. He planned, he planned my visit to Mumbai. He said, we'll make a human wall around you. We have a lot of people. And you go to court directly and we address the case. I agreed. And after this conversation, I even wrote about that. I may go to India soon. Mm -hmm. Four days later, I get the report that he was shot dead oh. in Mumbai streets. Oh, this was so, so related to this whole incident. Yeah, yeah. And so I cancelled my ticket again. Okay, I took a residence permit in Finland because I had changed a teaching assignment. I took along with the Finnish education department in the UNESCO affiliated institutions. And I registered here as a person walking and I remained in Finland. 2014, my mother was ill and she was dying. I was very close with my mother and uh, my father died some years back and she was connected to me so closely. And we have been talking regularly and she was in hospital, pneumonia, and she was going down. He was 80 plus. And the doctors said, my friends were there, that she may not survive long. So I was informed. So I thought somehow I should go and meet her. That was my feeling and hold her hand and uh, see her goodbye with my hand in her hand. And I talked to somebody in the Catholic Church in Mumbai, and I tried to, since I studied political science and international relations, I thought of a kind of a truce for some days, a white flag for some days. Don't trouble me. I'm going to come to India, but I would be seeing my mother and returning back. But don't make any trouble when I'm in India. Don't try to send people against me. But this should be a gentleman's agreement because my mother is dying. This is the message I sent to them with through a trusted friend inside. 
I was told that the Archbishop of Mumbai will respond to me. The Archbishop earlier wrote publicly on his website that I should apologize. The whole trouble will be over. I should apologize only. I said, bring all the torture machines from medieval times, but you don't get my apology. That is what I replied at the time. Wow. Here again, he said, and the person in the church informed me that we don't want to make any trouble for you. And we are very kind about these kind of situations. We will stop all trouble that we officially they say that they didn't make any trouble but here they say that they would stop everything all cases and everything will be withdrawn but i should make a private apology to the church oh. and what was my i told my sister about this my sister communicated this to the mother and the mother told her do you think he would apologize and come to see me she asked my sister my sister said i do not know he loves you so much i don't know but I don't think he should do it. He will not do it. But if he apologizes for seeing me, and if he comes for that, don't open the door for him. Close it for him. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That, that is, that, that's fantastic. <laughs> and two, two days later, she dies. I didn't apologize, of course. I immediately said that I don't want to see my mother with your mercy. And I, don't, I would never apologize because I have not done anything wrong. I would keep on saying it repeatedly till my last breath. Thank you very much. This has been thoroughly enlightening and very fascinating. And I am so honored to be able to speak to you and you're an inspiration to us all. Thank you so much. Thank you and nice meeting you. We'll be the guys. And for everybody watching, thank you so much for joining us. This has been Rationable Interviews with Sanal Edamaraku and it's been an absolutely amazing journey. Please give this video a like, subscribe to this channel if you want more amazing interviews like this and we'll see you in the next one. Until then, stay rationable. See you soon.